indices. Working with indices. Now there are three rules of indices. The first rule is, let's look at something like this. Let's suppose the question said that. When you multiply, you add the indices together. So 6 to the power 2 times 6 to the power 7 is 2 add 7, 9. That's called the first rule of indices. When you divide, these, two, these things are called the base numbers, by the way. And the base numbers have to be the same to be able to do this. So those base numbers were both sixes. And when you multiply, you add the indices, add the little numbers. But when you divide, let's suppose there's a 9 there and a 3 there, you subtract the indices. That's the first rule of indices. That's the second rule of indices. The third rule of indices is a very special one, where if you have a number there, and you have a bracket, and you have one up there. So that's saying raise the power 4 to the power 4 and then go and square it. And that, in fact, you can work out by multiplying these two indices together. Now, don't get that confused with the first rule of indices. The first rule of indices is definitely when you multiply, you add the indices together. This is a very special case. And that's what this one's all about. 2 raised to power 3, raised to power 2, will end up with 2 raised to power 3, raised to power 2, will end up as 2 to power 6. Now you can appreciate that by thinking to yourself you're doing 2 cubed and multiplying it by itself. When you square something, you multiply it by itself. So you're doing 2 cubed multiplied by 2 cubed. And that does fit in with the first rule of indices where you add the indices together. But to do it in one step like that is allowed because that's the third rule of indices. Now let's look at this one. You've got to do the root of 4 and square it. Which means multiply the root of 4 by itself. Now this is quite a simple idea that if you multiply the root of a number by itself you end up with the number. I hope that's okay because it's just sort of obvious. <laughs> the square root of a number multiplied by the square root of a number will give you the number itself. This one, the printing's not very clear there. Should look like this. But if you've got the paper in front of you and checking it all the time, which I hope you are, now let's look at that. Let's write this out fully. 5 to the power of 4 means 5 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 5 multiplied by 5. And 16 is a perfect square number. And it's 4 multiplied by 4. Now if you can write inside a square root sign pairs of numbers, there's a pair of 5's there, there's a pair of 5's there, there's a pair of 4's there. You can take this pair outside the square root sign, and as you take it outside, it becomes 5. Because you're doing the square root of 25 is 5. The square root of that 25 is 5. The square root of that 16 is 4. So if inside the square root sign, you can split it into multiplied numbers, multi um, product of numbers. For each pair you can take one outside. Then you're expected to work this out, which is 5 times 5 is 25, and 4 25s is 100. You could, of course, work out this, and if you work this out, let's put it up there. Because there's another way of doing it. You could actually work out 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 times 16 and actually work it out without a calculator and you'd end up with this number. And you can appreciate the square root of that is in fact 100. So there's more than one way to actually approach that question. Right, let's mark that. Now, nothing.
nothing extra special, one mark for that, but each one mark is so valuable. Another one mark for that. This one's actually worth two marks, and you'll get them if you end up with the answer. But you'll get one of them if you show some sort of working out along the way. But if you get the answer, then the two marks is for your answer of 100. Question 24. Well, we're doing quite well for time on this. I tried to fit in as much in the first part as I could to make sure we had enough time. And we most certainly have. Question 25. Now, looking in your book, you'll see I've not done the diagram completely. I've not got the letters on it. I wanted to fill them in as I read it. In the diagram, S... T U S T U are points on a circle with centre O. Now before we go any further, let's just have a think about this. This is a circle theorem question. When you get a circle theorem question, I think it's worth just studying the diagram and see which circle theorems you can see. Now, the first one I can see is I've got a diameter and I've got a semicircle. And one of the circle theorems is this. An angle in a semicircle is always 90 degrees. An angle in a semicircle is always 90 degrees. Let's look at a, get a piece of paper make a note of that. So if we have a circle and we have a diameter this is called the angle in the semicircle. It doesn't matter where you draw it, the angle in the semicircle. And the angle in a semicircle is always 90 degrees. Um, you can put that a different way if you want and say the angle on a diameter is always 90 degrees. The example accepts several variations of the circle theorem. Angle on a diameter is always 90 degrees. So that's the first thing I notice. Now the second thing I notice about that is when I read the next part of the question and it says XY It's a diameter, oh, sorry, it's a tangent to the circle. XY is a tangent to the circle. So let's have a look at that. If you have a circle and you have a line touching it, just touching it, no more, that's called a tangent. That there is called the point of contact. And this is a radius at the point of contact. And that's another circle theorem, that the angle between a tangent and a radius. Well, you can use the radius, the word radius or the word diameter. It doesn't matter, actually. I'll put diameter. The angle between a tangent and a diameter is always 90 degrees. That's another circle theorem. Angle between a tangent, there's the tangent, and there's the diameter, and there's the angle I'm talking about, because it's between them. It's always 90 degrees. So, I still haven't read the question, but I'm just looking at the diagram and seeing what I can spot. Now, in fact, there is another circle theorem there. Let's have a look at that one. If I now look at the circle, and this line touching it, and this line across here. This is the tangent. And this is the chord. And this is the angle between the tangent and the chord. And if I continue with the diagram like this, this angle up here is the same as that angle. 